Well, let's open with a word of prayer. Then I've got our icebreaker question for today. Let's pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this day. We are reminded of the many blessings that we have received from you and the ways in which they come to us through a variety of sources. We pray that you keep us mindful in our conversations this day of how your spirit works in and through your church as it gathers wherever it may be gathered. Guide us and, and lead us today for we make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, here's the icebreaker question. You have two hours to do something relaxing and you have a budget of $100. What will you do? I'm taking my family. That's real dinner. easy. <laughs> That's really easy. Manny Petty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Manny Petty, family to dinner. I would save it because I hate to spend money and I would read for now. <laughs> read. Okay. All right. I was going to say that, Andrew, and then I thought, oh, that really sounds bad. That's yeah, I'm, I'm pretty boring. I'm sorry. I know, me too. <laughs> well, the way things have been going for us recently, we'd probably have to fix something. Yes. Uh, we, it, it's just every time we turn around, something's breaking down. It's unbelievable. Okay. But, but is that relaxing? No, but oh, no. Uh, we don't have time to relax. We're retired. Okay, but this is, this, this, I'm, I'm giving you two hours to do something relaxing. What would you do? And you have, you can spend a hundred dollars doing it. I think I would still go for a walk. Okay. <laughs> I think I, pro I probably would end up wanting to go sailing. Sailing. Good. Oh, wow. Now I relax. Okay. Greg. I would find someone and give them the hundred dollars, the person in need. Okay. There's always one of those in every crowd. Oh, I know. Don't you just hate <laughs> oh, them? Yeah. Especially at turning points. Yeah. Especially at turning points. You get more underwear, Greg. I know. <laughs> oh, I got one on that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably sit and, and read and uh, not worry about spending the money, but... Uh, I'd be happy just not to fall asleep <laughs> if it's okay. in the middle of the day. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. I think I'd go down to the Soto Memorial, maybe take a nice sandwich and read. You take me with you? Oh, 400. I don't know. The sandwich. Is what I'm <laughs> uh, could we have another 100 for next year, maybe, and spend that now? No, we, 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 I can only give you the 100 for right now. Oh, Very good. Boy. Okay. Well, it's just this always kind of fun to listen to the various responses that, that folks would, would give to a question like that. Um, my, my first thoughts were I would just find a really nice out of the way coffee shop and a couple of friends and just sit around and drink coffee and talk about life. It would not, it would, and it would not involve anything that has to do with Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> or the church. Am I that. the only one that likes to spend money? <laughs> <laughs> no, I <don't>. Has, <laughs> Have you been to a coffee shop lately, Diane? <laughs> okay, yeah, we take no. all hundred dollars. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to spend some time talking about shoes um, but, but we're really not going to focus, you know, on the specifics of shoes because we, we can get bogged down into the different types of shoes, especially given our, our day and time as well. But if I were to guess as, and as I, as I shared with you in the, what I wrote and, and talked about, um, each of us has shoes for a variety of different times, for a variety of different occasions or things that we do as, as well. Um, I, I have dress shoes that I wear when I have to do you know, things that are more formal. Uh, I, ha I have casual shoes that, that encompass a variety of, of different things. Um, I, I have the athletic or running shoes that I wear, and then I've got the seasonal shoes, which I, I think I noted in the, what I wrote, it, sh it shifted, the seasonal shoes shifted from snow boots to uh, my Olakai's. Um, uh, at this point, which are which are basically really expensive flip flops, um, as well. How about you? Are there other categories of shoes that you might you might say that you have? Well, sometimes it depends where we are. In the summer, we do a lot of hiking, so we have.
hiking shoes. Okay. And uh, when I was still teaching, I had playground shoes that it didn't matter if they got filled with sand. And Mm -hmm. I just kept them at school and used them for that. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, I have water shoes for when I go canoeing and want to get out in the water. Okay. I was just thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Greg? Well, I have, since I mow the lawn, I have mowing shoes such that if they get turned green, I don't care. Okay. All right. My my mowing shoes were my worn out running shoes. (laughs) Okay. Okay. other categories of shoes that, that folks might have? Stilettos, sling bags. Stilettos. Oh, wow. So you're talking styles now. Huh? <laughs> Very good. Okay. That, so, so and, and I'm not going to ask you necessarily to give us an inventory of you know, how many pairs of shoes you think you have or, or you actually know that you have um, and, and the different types and styles, those, those sorts of things as well. You, you'll certainly reflect on those maybe as we have this conversation today um, or whatever. Shoes are, are something that have been with us for a long time. We, they, they are essential to us in a variety of different ways. We wear them as decoration to you know, complement an outfit that we might have to uh, as a form of celebration, I was trying to think, are there, are there shoes, are there occasions that require special shoes other than a bride and a wedding? Golf shoes. Okay, yeah. golf shoes, okay. Tennis shoes. Okay. Did anybody say slippers? Slippers? Slippers no, are I didn't, kind I didn't. of shoe. That's true. That's true. Okay. Bowling shoes. Bowling shoes. Okay. All right. Alabama so, shoes. Viking shoes. Okay. So, so there are a variety within, within a, a broader category of shoes, you know, f- designed for sports and activity activities that, that, that are related to sports um, as well. In, um, you know, there, there are shoes that are worn um, uh, army boots that, you know, that soldiers might wear for combat or, or whatever the case may be, um, as well in, in Jesus time. And in the place where he lived, shoes were used for a variety of purposes, just as we use them today. The most prevalent kind of shoe, given the, the climate, given, given the lo- given location, uh, of the Middle East were likely to be more sandal type of shoes. But even, even then, as we know now, there are different kinds of sandals that, that folks might wear. Um, it would oftentimes vary according to the, the region in which you lived. If you lived in, a, in more of a northern portion of the area, where the temperatures might get colder, your sandals might have a little more in the way of covering. If you lived in the the southern portions of the area, your your sandals might be more like my Olokais um, and and merely merely provide the covering or protection for the bottoms of your feet as well. Uh, Again, soldiers would wear a certain type of sandal. Uh, Merchants might wear a different type of sandals as well, but there were also those people in their, in their day and time who did not have shoes. They could, they could not afford shoes. They were the poorest of, of their generation. And I kept, uh, I kept thinking about uh, stories that I've heard others tell about growing up during times of economic hardship and in certain places around the country where, um, the people, even in, in, in our own country, could not afford shoes. They, they did not have shoes through, through parts of the depression or times of depression or, or just given their, their family's economic circumstance. Uh, there is in um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, there is, is one brief description of a, of a child in the class of one of the, the lead characters. I think it's, I think it's in Scouts. Um, school class of a, of a person who it, I, I think I was looking earlier and something about he had um, 
uh, ringworm or something, and everyone knew that you got ringworm because you wandered around the farmyard and you nor- you never wore shoes. And and this young you know this person this child uh, was in a was part of a family where the likelihood of actually owning shoes was pretty slim, or if they did own shoes, the shoes were worn only on very special occasions as well. Have any of you ever um, encountered people who've talked about in, in their, uh, their lifetime, you know, either knowing someone or personally you know, not having shoes? We had a family, we probably had more than it, had one, but I know for sure we had one family at school that had quite a number of children and they would have, they would come to school with a pair of shoes, but as the year went on, they would grow. So would their feet Mm -hmm. and this, they would still have the same pair of shoes. And then they would complain of course, because their feet hurt because the shoes were way too small. Mm -hmm. So a couple of us used to always try to keep extra shoes for them and they would did not want to take them home. They would wear their old ratty shoes to school and wear them home, but they kept the shoes that felt better and looked better at school. Okay. Because they didn't want anything to to happen to them. Okay. And at the end of the school year, then they would take them home. But by that time probably most of them didn't uh, Sure, didn't sure. fit anymore. Sure, sure. But and, and sort of related, related to that, if it was a family with lots of children, shoes may be passed from child to child, mm-hmm. from older to younger um, in, in those, those circumstances. Greg, as part of Turning Point's uh, work and so forth, do they collect shoes for people who are, are part of that program? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, I, I end up washing a myriad of things. Okay. okay. People can t- donate at any time. Oh, God save them. And no. the other thing, I just want to comment on, you can't believe how many people were overjoyed to end up with the undies. Sure. In January, yes. 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 My, my wife was in her, she's in the clothes closet. She actually gives the clothes away. Okay. okay? And mm-hmm. she was so happy that she got... What, 100 pairs or whatever like this, but sure. you're not, they're all gone now. Okay. Right, right, hmm. exactly. So, so shoes were, you know, uh, an important part of life. And again, not everyone, because of economic circumstances, was able to have shoes. Uh, and, and even, even in our own day and time, <clears throat> there are those persons that, that cannot afford shoes as well, or, or they are, are limited. Um, in, in what they can have in terms of shoes. Um, shoes were, were then and are now important when you're going to travel. Uh, shoes were also important for, uh, well, well, shoes were, were, because they were an important implement, they also needed to be treated with a certain amount of respect. Um, they were oftentimes not worn when you went inside a home, you'd take your shoes off at the door. Uh, how many, how many cultures do we know, you know, in our own day and time where, where you, you leave your shoes at the front door. Any young been? people do that now here? Oh yeah. I was uh, just going to say my children and grandchildren, when they walk through the front door, all the shoes come off. And at the end of the dinner or time of visiting, I have to sort out where, whose shoes are what. <laughs> okay. All right. Exactly. Some of them are similar. <laughs> right. That's, that could be very true. Indeed. Um, if you opened my front door and just, just off the front door, you'll find two pairs of running shoes. Because when I get finished with my run in the morning and I step inside, those are the first things that come off my feet um, as, as well. Uh, in, in Hawaii and, and in Asian households, 
you're discouraged from wearing shoes indoors, you, there is a place for you to take your shoes off when you step inside or, or even outside. Sometimes there's a, a sign with the admonition to leave your shoes here. And when you get ready to leave, make sure you leave with the shoes you came with and not ones that look better than yours <laughs> as well. Shoes were, were uh, a, an important custom in biblical times when it came to even property as well. If you think back to the, the story of Ruth, if you look at, at the book of Ruth, you'll find that, uh, that Boaz, when it is time for him to, to redeem Ruth, and I know this is, this is going to make, uh, this makes me a little uncomfortable talking in terms of that, because it, it, it hearkens to a time when women were considered to be property and were not considered to be individuals. But, but the redemption of Ruth occurred when Boaz and the rightful heir, who, who had every right to claim Ruth as his wife or, or as to, to be her sponsor, um, they exchanged a shoe. Symbolically, handing a shoe to the other person could uh, symbolize the transfer of ownership of property as well. Uh, the, the, there are customs regarding shoes related to both marriage as well as divorce as well. If, if uh, in, some, in some ancient cultures, if a woman took a man's shoes and placed them outside the door, that was her issuance of, I want a divorce um, as, as well. It, it won't work here. Sorry. Okay. Just, just bear in mind, it won't work here. Um, as well. So now that, that we've sort of talked a little bit in detail about shoes and, and those sorts of things, um, what I tried to do for our discussion today is to uh, get more to the heart of, of what the passages are about, even though they touch on the idea of shoes. So I tried to create three separate questions that we, we might use as the, the main topics for today. The first question is, is there any place God won't go? The second question is, is there anyone God doesn't love? And the third question is, is there something we can do? Those, those are the three, three major questions. And we're going to take a look at uh, two passages from the book of Exodus. And we're going to take a look, a look at one passage from the book of Luke as as well so uh let, let me sort of set the the background for the book of luke or excuse me for the book of exodus um when when we look at timelines and and those sorts of things uh, well let me ask you how long ago do you think moses lived I don't see anyone looks like they're Googling the information. I'm trying to do my math. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's likely that Moses was born sometime around 1400 or 1500 BCE before the common era. And it's likely that the Exodus, the, the event called the Exodus, or known as the Exodus, um, occurred sometime around 1445 BCE. That kind of helps you put it in, in, in a, a time frame as well. The book of Exodus is likely, was likely not put down in a written and final form like we see it today until sometime around the 600 BCE era, so sometime around the sixth century of um, before the Common Era, as well. And during that particular time period, that means it would have been written while the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. So, so when we look at the Book of Exodus, it is not it is not written as though uh, it, it were being being recorded for us as the events are happening, but is, it is being, has been written for us after having been shared through oral tradition, through oral history 
for a period of close to a thousand years from, from the time of the actual Exodus itself. So, so that, that sort of helps you to kind of kind of get that, that time frame in place, but it also allows us to, to look at the events of, of Exodus in light of not only what occurred among the Israelites during their time of slavery in Egypt, but to also compare it to the events that the Israelites were, were experiencing during their time in Babylonian captivity as well. Because if you, if you take a look at, at several of the, the pieces that are, are, are told in Exodus and you compare it to the events of the exile, you see some similarities between the two. Uh, there is the theme of liberation, which is evident in the book of Exodus in terms of being liberated, freed from, from bondage and slavery in, in Egypt, but it also applies to the hope of the, the, the Jewish people who had been carried away into exile in Babylon. There is a theme of law in which in Exodus, we hear of how Moses receives the law from God and, and how that law is to govern their relationship with one another and their relationship with God. And it is presented as almost a counter ethic to the laws of the Babylonian empire, which would say you worship the, the king, you, you pay homage to the government of this day, you, you don't have uh, a relationship with a, a god of any, any type. There's the, the theme of covenant that we see in, in the book of Exodus, where God says, I am the Lord your God, the one who led you out of the house of, of slavery or out of, out of Egypt into a land of freedom. And, and um, I, uh, you know, I will establish my covenant with you, along with the idea of covenant that the prophets are sharing or are, are uh, announcing in terms of the time that will come when the people of, of Israel will be released from their captivity in Babylon as well. Um, there is the reminder of the presence of God in, in Exodus. We see that through uh, God being present to them in the cloud and in the pillar of fire. Uh, in, during the, the time of exile, uh, there is the reminder that God is about to do a new thing. This Sunday, the, the reading from Jeremiah 31 says, uh, God says, I'm about to do a new thing. The, I will write the law. It will be evident on their hearts, not necessarily on tablets of stone as well. So when we, when we read the book of Exodus and we think about it in the context of the events that were described through the oral tradition, through the history that was shared, and we, we consider it during the time in which the text would have been written down, being that period of, of exile, it, it gives us, I, I think, a little, uh, I think, a fresh perspective on, on what this book has to say across generations as well. Because if it can mean one thing to the folks of the, the period of the exile of 1400 BCE and can have a similar meaning to to those people in the 6th century BCE, it can, it can likely have a similar meaning and, of, uh, and importance for those of us who live in the 21st century of the common era as well. So um, let's take a look first at Exodus chapter. Well, let me ask a question. Is that too much information? Do you need to debrief some of it? Do you have questions that have come up? You understand it perfectly. Okay, all that material is going to be on the final exam in a couple of weeks, okay? <laughs> we're, going to we're going to take a look um, first at Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to bring up my document and share the screen. Okay. You should see the screen that says uh, scripture for week five, and it begins with the section um, Exodus 3, verses 1 through 5. It says, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. 
he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of fire, flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to, to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Um, note, note in the very beginning of this, it says that um, Moses is keeping the flock of his father-in-law. And it says uh, in a phrase that sometimes we might even miss, it says he led the flock beyond the wilderness. What's your understanding of, of what wilderness means in scripture? Or, or, or let me ask you this question. Describe for me a wilderness. Woods. <laughs> trees and foliage. Okay. Trees and, trees and foliage brush around. Okay. Or like a desert. A imprint of man. Desert. The prairies. prairies. Uh, pra okay. An imprint of man. Like absent of human <clears throat> presence. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other other thoughts about a wilderness? You're you're all exactly right. No no one has said anything you know, wrong at all about about that. The wilderness is is oftentimes described as that place that is beyond the limits of settlement. It's beyond governmental control um, as well. The Hebrew word that's that's translated wilderness in this text is is defined as that which is desolate and deserted, or that which is beyond, mm -hmm. as as well. Um, the wilderness, if it's understood mm -hmm. as a place that where, where there are, well, that is beyond the limits of settlement, beyond government control. Um, would also be perceived as a place of um, danger. It would be also considered a place of disorder mm -hmm. as well. But notice what, what the verse says. Moses not, isn't just going into the wilderness. It says he's going beyond, beyond. the wilderness. Are, are, there, are there those places that you might call or describe in our in our own day and time as wilderness. Let's not let's not even go to the the beyond the wilderness. Let's 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 think about you know what are what are places that we might describe in our own day and time as the wilderness. Um, uh, you know, apart from the, the the physical thing of trees and shrubs and desert kind of things. Everglades. The Everglades. Okay. All right. Think of a, a place of illness and grief. Okay. All right. All right. A, a place where there could be illness, grief, um, pain. Yeah. The Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert. Okay. All right. That that would be a place. You know, Is, there's a park up in North North Georgia. Um, I guess it's just south of of uh, Gainesville, uh, that's a park, but it's Payne's Prairie. Yeah. And yeah. when you go past there on the interstate and look out on mm -hmm. either side, it's it's pretty much a prairie there. That would be pretty okay. much a wilderness. You know, I mean, there are okay. trees there or ponds or lakes or whatever, but okay. there isn't much else. All right, let's let's think in terms of closer to home. <clears throat> well, what? When, you, when you first become a parent, right. you know, like that's something that you've never experienced. It's, it's okay to you, right? It's it, it's uncharted territory, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. All right, so let let let's get even closer to home. Which is the which is the bad side of town? <laughs> Where's the place? I, I've been in I've been in communities 
where they have said, oh, you don't want to be in this part of town after this time of day. Uh-huh. The east side of Brighton. Right. East side of downtown. Okay. Yeah. Are, you know, are, are, where are those places where even the police will be less present? Newtown. Okay. So wilderness can be those physical places like the Sahara Desert or, or a park that's you know, part of a, uh, the Badlands kind of uh, area or um, well, wooded, the Everglades swamps kinds of things. Yeah, but, they, oh, okay, swamp would be, uh, yeah. Okay. But it, but it also, in, in our day and time, can connote or denote those places where we think that, oh, this is beyond the limits of settlement. This is, this is a place where, where government doesn't apply. It makes you uncomfortable. Right, exactly. So, so what, what do you think the narrator of the story might be telling mm. readers when, when, you know, when they say that Pardon? they're going beyond the wilderness? They can? We can, Patty. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. answering. You're answering the question. The tech welcome. person was answering. Welcome, welcome, Patty. Thank you. It's glad to be here. <laughs> Patty, you're going to have to stay after about a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> I am not staying an hour after. <laughs> thank you, Z- uh, Naz. Okay. Okay, and do you know, will that happen next time or will it be okay? I'm hoping it'll be okay. Okay, well, I've got your number and I'll I'm try not to be a pest. Thank you. Excellent. Very good. That, that's, that's great. We got, we got you connected. In there. So, so again, what, what do you think the, the narrator of the story is, is suggesting to readers when it says that Moses went beyond the wilderness? Could be in, in space, uh, um, you know, beyond yeah. the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Kind of says to me that God was not in the wilderness; that He was on Horeb, uh, Mount Horeb, and that that was perhaps a lush place, or um, that wasn't in the wilderness. Okay, so so he goes. He's he's in the vicinity of Horeb, and we that that's known as the mount, uh, mountain of God. Right. And and yet we we also read that Moses has gone beyond the wilderness. The, Horeb is not the wilderness, and Moses has gone not you know not just to Horeb. He's gone beyond that into the wilderness. He's gone that gone beyond the wilderness. <coughs> Think about another biblical story about a guy who has an encounter with a big fish. Well. <laughs> Jonah, of course. What what's what's Jonah trying to do? God says, "I have a job for you to do." And what does Jonah do? He hides. Yeah. He, hides. Yeah. he says, "No, I don't want to go." <laughs> right. He says, "I don't want to go," and he and he attempts to flee. He yeah. attempt. He buys passage on a ship headed to a place where he's pretty certain that he will not have to deal with God. Are there, are there those places, those times in our own lives, in our own journeys, when we just wish that we could not be known by God? Or, or that, is, is there some way that we can just uh, avoid having you around God? God is everywhere. Okay. Yeah. And Moses kind of ran right towards him. He wanted to know what this great thing was. Sure, sure. Curiosity was getting the better of him in this particular instance because I mean it doesn't say you know explicitly that Moses is is trying to avoid God um, in, in this particular story, but but I think the imagery, the symbolism, and the narration of the story is is important for us to to take into account because we do find in our own lives those times and places where we have we've attempted to ignore 
or we've, we've tried to find this place and say, oh, well, certainly God cannot be here. You know, it's, it's after five o'clock on the east, east side of town or the new town part of Bradenton. So we know that God's not going to hang around here. But what does Moses discover? He discovers that God is not only there, God was there before Moses even arrived in, in that place. And, and so Moses is, is surprised. He wants to investigate and um, God stops him, says, no, don't come, don't come any closer. And God says, take off the shoes that you're wearing because where you are, are standing is holy ground. So are there places or have you been in a place where you were very much aware of God's presence? Sure. Okay. What about that yeah, that I moment or, or that place? Yes. Uh, the, the symbolism of taking off your shoes for holy God. <laughs> what is that symbol? Why do you have to take off your shoes? I mean, uh, okay. Well, what what why do you why do you think the why do why do people take off their shoes? <clears throat> well, then to make the house to have, actually the house will get dirty or. Um, you're not okay. bringing in to play outside, but I, I'm the sentence of holy ground bare feet. Why okay. is it a sense of reverence or being closer to the thing that is is the thing that you should have reverence for? Okay, yeah, yeah, and that's why you take off a shoe <clears throat> or a custom it, it, in some places. Yes, it is custom. Um, yeah. in, in, in this particular, in this particular instance, uh, I think the admonition <clears throat> is, as, as Andrea says, um, it is, you know, acknowledging that the place you stand on is more than just the ordinary. You, you are standing in some place special, some, holy. something extraordinary, some, something whole, someplace holy, I guess is, is the way to describe that Yeah, uh, as well. But, so, but what is it about that place or that moment when you were aware of God's presence that made you acknowledge that it was a holy place or a holy time? Mm. I had to lie down. Okay. All right. There was a, uh, uh, when I went to Spain or uh, uh, Barcelona, uh, Gotti's Cathedral is so it, it's so extraordinary. It, it, it makes you feel like there is a God present. Okay. All right. So so there's this over overwhelming sense that indeed God is there. Okay. Uh, some some have described that while they stand on the top of a mountain and they look out at the the surrounding vistas of the the mountain mm -hmm. ranges. Some have, have described that as they stood on the shore of a lake or the gulf or the ocean and watched the waves roll in or, or just, just watch the water itself. I there, think there are, that some women, uh, mothers could understand that at the birth of a child that you know that God is there. It's so overwhelming. Okay. All right. When I look at the sky, and this is just about every time I can't help hoping God is there. I, I love to paint skies. I love to look at the earth. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just always different and always phenomenal. Right. So, so no matter no matter where we are in whatever the vistas might be, we acknowledge that God is present. That there is no place that God will not be a part of. Um, of that experience or, or can be a part. And each of the spaces can be holy ground. I, I would suspect that Greg would, would likely echo that there have been moments in the midst of the laundry room at, at turning points that God has, has not shown up. You know, he's, he's not been, been uh, or that he's been very much aware of God's presence. So having talked about, um, is, you know, is there any place that God won't go? Now let's talk about, is there anyone God doesn't love? 
we want to take a look at a very familiar, another a very familiar passage, uh, only a portion of it now. So it's going to be really difficult for many of us to to avoid leaping ahead into this particular story. This is this is the first half of the parable of the prodigal. Okay, from Luke 15, Jesus mm-hmm. said. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and the get and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. In, in Tuesday's devotional uh, for, for this particular week, uh, Duffield shared the comment that was made by one young person during a, mi- a mission trip noting his experience of having worked in a mission center. And, and Greg has already mentioned this, you know, people get excited about new underwear. <laughs> and, and while she, she described that the, when that statement was made, people in the group chuckle at it. Um, but she also concluded that this young person had noticed the impact of something everyone in the group no doubt took for granted. We don't really think much about a new pair of underwear or a new pair of of socks Mm -hmm. or or many of the items we have. We may not even think twice about a new pair of shoes. Um, Do do you, I'll go back to the question about our conversations about shoes. How many times a year do you, would you say you go shopping for shoes? Depends on the year. (laughs) What's going on? Okay. Once every eight years. Um, every eight <laughs> years. <laughs> when I got holes in the soles on my feet. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I'm talking about Don. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, about the underwear, has anybody heard the story of the Polish, uh, the General uh, Polanski and the Polish Army about underwear? No. No. Well, the, the Nazis or the German march into Poland within three days, and they did, they just dis- destroyed his army. The army uh, then could not; they can't. They they have very little to eat, uh, no places to, to to sleep, and they were in their clothes. And General Pulaski wanted to pick up their morale, so he stood before his army and he said to him, "Today we're all going to get new underwear." He says. Stash, you change it with ball, bowling. You over there change it. Pass it to your left. I, I thought I was going to be moved to tears, Al. <laughs> <laughs> They're tears of a different kind. <laughs> Luke 15 um, is made up of three different parables. Two are, are about lost things, and the third that, that you, we read por- a portion of is about someone who is lost. Jesus tells those, re- those parables in response to criticism of him and, and others like him um, because he was associating with the wrong kinds of people. 
they were people that most like the, the people that Jesus was eating dinner with, that he was associating with, came from the bad <laughs> side of town, according to the religious authorities. And so they, they begin to question, they begin to challenge um, what, why would Jesus do this? Why would someone who is religious want to engage with those who are clearly sinners? Now, when you look at the sort of the do the percentages on each of the in each of the parables, the first parable about the loss of a uh, lamb or uh, one sheep from the flock out of uh, a flock of a hundred, <laughs> that the loss of that single sheep is. Um, represents 1% of that flock. In the second parable, there's, uh, uh, there are 10 coins that a woman has and she loses one of them. And one out of 10 is a 10% loss. So you see the percentages in terms of the loss are, are somewhat growing. And it says in this parable that a man has two sons and one of the sons is lost. 50% is, is what is just, just sort of looking, looking at the, the numbers there. Um, but in every one of those cases, there is a celebration that takes place. The, the, the person, the shepherd who goes and looks for the one lamb, when they find it, they come back and they celebrate. Mm -hmm. When, when the woman finds the one coin, 10% of what she has, she calls her friends and says, come and celebrate with me. So clearly the, the father who is celebrating the return of a lost son, 50% would invite everyone to come and to, to share in the, the joy that he experiences as well. Um, the, as I say, the, the, we're not talking about objects like we were in the, in the first two par parables. We're talking about an individual here. Um, so it does seem a little heartless, seems a little callous to, to be talking in terms of percentages and, and those sorts of, of things. Um, keep in mind that, that there are some cultural aspects to, to this parable as well. It's not just the association with undesirables and those sorts of things. There there are some cultural or familial relation issues that are at work here. Because when the younger son requests the, the inheritance that is due him, while his father is still alive, he is in essence declaring publicly and more personally to his father that I wish you were dead. By, by asking to receive the inheritance that, that would be due him, before his father is, is, in, is buried, he is saying, I really wish you were dead. I no, no longer want to be a part of this family. And, and so he, he inappropriately asks for, for his, his share of the inheritance. His father is under no obligation to give him the inheritance, but he does. And as the story unfolds, he squanders it. He, he finds himself in a, a dire relationship. It would also have been very um, appropriate in the, in the culture of that day upon his return for the father to say, who are you? Because by the same way that the son might declare his father dead, when the father gave away or gave to him what would have been rightfully his as, inher as, his, as his inheritance, um, he, he was basically saying, you, you no longer belong to me. You are no longer my child. But instead, as the story unfolds, the father has such love and compassion that, that none of that matters. The father is, is not going to ignore this child who has returned. Uh, he, can know, he cannot see this child as being dead to him um, as, as well. Um, the father is, is overjoyed and he, he tells the servants to bring the best robe, to bring rings, to bring shoes. He's extending grace. Um, and in, in her description of this, Duffield writes that grace never does just enough. Bring the best robe, put rings on his finger, give him, you know, give him a, a new pair of shoes to wear. 
it, as, as she writes, grace overflows, explodes, exceeds, gratuitous, gratuitously manifests in unexpected ways. And then grace is, ex, is exhibited by embarrassing public displays of affection, weeping in joy, running in welcome, new robes, new shoes, a huge party where all have been invited. So no one could possibly question the value or belovedness of even the child who had rejected and gone away. She asks um, in, in that particular um, devotion, have you ever been surprised by a gracious response when you expected judgment? And have you offered grace to someone who mm -hmm. might be expecting your judgment? You can think about that. The third, the third question is for, for our general topics is, is there some, something we can do? And when you get to the reading for Friday of, of this week, you'll encounter two very powerful anecdotes that she shares that describe mm -hmm. the lives of people who have left their homes or have been forced from their homes. She writes about photographs that were uh, of items that were considered non-essential items that were taken um, from those migrants who were trying to cross from the southern border into the U.S. And she also describes the, um, the art project, the Art of Tears is what it's called, in which migrant children are drawing pictures of their home or they're, they're describing an artwork, their journey. As they, as they make their way across. So the third of our passages for today is from Exodus chapter 12. This is a passage that describes the way in which the Israelites were to eat the Passover meal on the night in which the, uh, the angel of death or in which God would pass through all of Egypt and kill the firstborn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike down the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Those verses describe how the Israelites were to eat the Passover and in the coming hours, as they, as they finish this particular meal, they would be leaving slavery. If you look a little bit further in this chapter, uh, around verse 33, and, and in the, the time following the deaths of the firstborn, um, it says, the Egyptians urged the people to hasten from the land, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their cloaks and, and on their shoulders. Now, those of you who are bakers in the group, what, what do you have to do with dough to prepare it for baking? Yeah. Will you rise. It rise? Will it rise? Right. And, and <laughs> will it rise by being jostled about in a bowl or in a, in a container, or does it have to sit idle or you know sit untouched to rise usually it needs to sit in a warm space okay um, so in this in in this particular instance the israelites have been have been told or forced to leave their land and and it describes that you know in the middle of the night they they have to gather up Whatever it is, they can they can gather, and be ready to leave. Living bread. And so, so she asks, "Have you ever had to leave your home quickly? And if so, what did you take?" Or, and and this is this is sort of the game that uh, it's a really strange game that we used to play. You know, if you had to leave your home, what would you take with you? You know, if all of a sudden you had to you had to leave, what what would you take? And the, and the only, I've never had to experience that sort of, of thing, but I think in terms particularly of out West uh, mm -hmm. and the families that are affected by wildfire, right? that oftentimes you are, you, you have a precious little amount of time. 
to collect and, and get what you need and get out of harm's way. If I had a pet, I would take my pet. Okay. My pet, yeah. Okay. Photo albums. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sometimes they're lucky to get away with their, what they have on their back and what they can put on their, on their feet because the fire comes quickly or the, the mm -hmm. water rises quickly. I think about those people in, in Houston and so forth in that area this winter when they had to wait for boats to, to come and, and rescue them. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israelites took unleavened bread to go in, out of the, to the wilderness. They, well, they, their, the command was on the Passover evening that they would eat bread without leavening in it. So, mm -hmm. so the bread that they would eat for that meal had, had not been, yeast had not been added. Right. It, was, it was just flat, kind of, kind of like the little communion wafers that we try to eat <laughs> each month. Uh, under that cellophane wrapper. Mm. Uh, matzahs. Yeah, matzahs. I, I attribute it more to cardboard, but yeah. Yes, cardboard. <laughs> it's cardboard. It's cardboard. Or, or, or poster board, maybe. Maybe, maybe it's poster board. Yeah. Um, uh, Matzah will either, will eat, you know, crackle and crumble and that kind of thing. So, But right. those little wafers don't do any. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so, so they, yeah, they hurriedly had to, or, or for the meal, they ate unleavened bread because they did not have the time to wait for it to rise. But then after the angel of death has passed through the, and, and the Egyptians say enough, leave. The, the government came in and essentially said, or the empire came in and said, get out of here. And, and you know, it, it's, it is one thing to uh, have uh, you know, the, the bit of time that you might have if there's a wildfire situation. Um, I'm not sure. Let, I'm actually going to close the screen share so I can see your faces a little <laughs> more closely. So, so um, now, that, now that I can see Liz's face, I'm going to ask, do you have uh, a, a plan do you have a kit or a box so that in the event of a wildfire you would be just grab that and go you're on mute yes we do okay all right. and we also keep all our um wallet keys and all that in one little bin so that okay. can be grabbed also but okay yeah we didn't do that until this past summer when we had a fire eight miles from our house and okay. then we put that together. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, and for those of you who aren't in California, but you're here and you, you know, the effects of hurricanes, do you have kits? Do you have things mm -hmm. already pre boxed or, or you have set to grab if you needed to evacuate from your homes because of a hurricane? Yes. I know what I want to grab, but I haven't yes. grabbed it. <laughs> okay. We at least have some time, which is mm -hmm. a blessing. That's true. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. And and you do you do sometimes get a little more time with a wildfire, but not a whole lot um, as well. Yeah, I, I think I think about the variety of places and circumstances in which people have no time. The mm -hmm. the army okay. rolls into town. And you've got to go right now. Mm -hmm. Well, think about the, you know, the Berlin Wall. You know, okay. people are gone for the day. Yeah. Okay. Or whatever. And then they were separated for the next 40 years or whatever. So. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it, sort of the, the general, the general heading for this is, is there something that we can do? Knowing, knowing that there are, there are those times, there are those persons that um, find themselves in desperate situations. And I know we're, we're, I'm, I'm skating right around the edge of a very hot political topic in terms of immigration, immigration policies, those sorts of things. Um, is there something we can do? Because there, there are as there are many different kinds of shoes in your closet or in your garage or wherever you may keep your shoes, 
there are very many different types of stories and circumstances for people who are coming to the border to try and, and find security, peace, prosperity, hope as they move into to our own country. Can sponsor them. Okay. Well, it's it's a it's a very complicated. If we took care of the where they come from, and helped them with their, they won't they won't want to immigrate here. Okay. Uh, but it seems like that kind of help Al goes to the wrong people. Yes, yes, I understand that. I understand, perfectly, but but that the solution. Yeah, this problem is very complicated, Don. It's not that easy. Yes, no. Uh, right. You know, we do not want them to come, and at the same time, uh, we have to feel sorry for them, and, they, and they're human beings, and they they deserve to be uh, live in peace and happiness. Okay, it, it's a it's a dual sword. It, it, right. Uh, yes. I it's, yeah, I taught with someone whose um, parents were um, fortunate enough to be uh, to escape, I guess, for the lack of a better word, from Cuba. Okay. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, when all of that unrest was uh, down there, and there was a fan, uh, there was a church in Sarasota area that um, took in a number of families, okay. and her, uh, you know. Parents, grandparents were among those that were uh, taken care of, given jobs. Uh, her dad worked as the janitor for the church, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, she wasn't born till she was here. But um, that was a, a real um, experience for her and her family. And they were eternally grateful okay. to be right. able to, to come to the United States. Obviously, I mean, we can always pray. That is something we can all always do. Correct. Right. Correct. Exactly. We, Honestly, we will... I need to tell you about the, the people that they sponsored from uh, Southeast Asia. Okay. Don, you got stories. What? Oh, oh. I'm sorry, Betty. I was thinking you said you were going to tell stories. about it. Yes, uh, it was something, uh, mm -hmm. a family from Laos that, oh, there were eight, probably eight in the family, including a little grandma, and all they had were the clothes on their backs when they came. Mm -hmm. And it was actually our youth group that asked our associate pastor if we could do that. Okay. And the church voted on it, and they voted yes. Uh, un unfortunately, there were people in our congregation that had fought in the war. And um, so they, uh, it was hard for them, I'll say that, uh, yeah. to do this. But Pamasola did it. And they really um, came through. And they really came through. And we rented a house from uh, one of our congregants. And um, we took care of them until they were on their own. And, and we have spoken to them not long go and one is an accountant finished number one in her class at the university of south florida one uh is an engineer one owns a karate studio uh, they've done they've very all well. done well and uh, uh the dad we found him a job as a tailor he was a expert tailor over in laos and he did well and they live now up in um, St. Petersburg, and their daughter just called us not long ago, and she opened, bless her heart, she opened a restaurant <laughs> well, at the very large. beginning of COVID, mm. uh, a, a Laotian restaurant, <laughs> and it was right on the main street, and she was so excited and wanted us to come up there for opening night, and unfortunately, we were away, but of course, it didn't stay open, and we don't know what's happened to it now. Sure. But anyway, it was a marvelous experience, We've not only a wedding. for our church, but for the young people that did this, that they saw how much they received a lot more than we gave. Very good. And, and not long ago, one of them came to church and they wanted to see Dr. Don. 
and um, <laughs> he found on and he gave him a hundred dollars and he says this no is a check for two hundred dollars oh a check and for two hundred dollars this is about ten years later yeah and he uh, said we just wanted to uh, thank you for all you did for our family they brought that brought tear that's that's good. So Westminster so had also sponsored a family. I don't know where they were from. We were not there at that time, but I do know that they would come. In fact, not too, too long ago, I guess a year, at least anyway, now uh, came to visit. I'm not sure where they live now, but they would periodically. Um, the older of the generation would would come and and visit. And our people were some of our people still keep in touch with them we uh we have so many funny stories and i'm not going to tell those now they're 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 really really funny but i gotta tell you my favorite i think is uh, linda thought if we buy a, a cockatiel that would help teach them english <laughs> he would choose that one he would choose oh, you, that. He oh, that he's a project light and these people that come across, some of them legally and some illegally, they want to learn the uh, uh, customs, and I teach them English, and they are so grateful for the for, to come to class. And uh, they're from different parts of the. Uh, I have them from uh, Venezuela. I had a couple from Belgium. I had, uh, and they they come together in my little classroom and uh, I try to teach them English. They want to learn about the United States of America. They want to become citizens. So, Our son and daughter-in-law are working with Afghans in, in Colorado Springs. And those people, many of them helped us during the war as interpreters. And let me tell you, their lives are really in danger. So they got out of there and uh, we've taken darn good care of them, and they're outstanding people. I mean, Excellent. many of them well-educated and having to work in a warehouse when they're a doctor, you know. Uh, uh, it's just, um, but it's very rewarding. Sharon wrote us a, an email this past weekend that went on uh, Christian, and believe me, that is tough. tough. Exactly. You are. So you are. I'm so you you all see how important our shoes can be. Mm -hmm. I think we've kind of exhausted the topic of shoes. Um, unless you want to go out and have a, we all want to meet up and spend a two hour relaxing time shopping at the local <laughs> whatever shoe store. <laughs> or hiking. Wow, or hiking. that'd be fun. Uh, Oh, uh, well, you've each got $100 to spend. So, you know, <laughs> that'll get you at least half one a pair, pair of shoes, shoes. half pair. a pair of shoes, maybe one pair. Okay. Two pair. I just okay. get Linda one shoe. That way she can't go too far. Uh, ah. Just goes in circle. Okay. And I already spent my $100 on my Manny Petty. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, very good. Well, next week when we meet, we'll, we will uh, be talking about the object known as oil as well. And I have to admit that when I, when I first was considering doing the promotional piece for um, this, or you're doing, doing sort of the video teaser for, for this Bible study, I was going to sing the theme song from the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> Tell you all the story about a man named Jay, poor mountaineer, but he kept spending the, you know, Texas tea, those sorts of things um, as well. But I, I decided not to do that because I wanted you to show up for, <laughs> I for Bible study um, as well. But next week we will, we will definitely talk Stick about um, oil and the, um, the very several different passages related to um, to oil and anointment as well. Hi George. Oh, hi George. Hi George. Thank you. Um, uh, Diane will give you all the notes so that you can be prepared for the final exam. Okay, that's good. Why don't you guys that? Okay. Very good. You also write it for me. <laughs> Stays in the group, guys. <laughs> Very good then. So let's, um, let's close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. We are grateful to you, O oh God, for the places where we discover you are already at 
for those burning bushes and for the reminder of the, the times where we stand on holy ground, for the value that we have when we feel worthless in, in the sight of the world or even in our own vision. We pray for those in our world who face uncertainty each and every hour of the day, who wonder what tonight might bring for them, what tomorrow will certainly look like. We pray that in whatever ways you might give us vision and insight into how we might continue to serve you through serving and caring for them. Bless us as we make our way through the remainder of this day. Remind us that you have promised that blessing to us each and every day. For we make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I'm Thank praying you. that I get.